You are welcome to your health education channel. Today's episode centers around hemoglobin A1C. I specifically chose this topic because I want all our viewers to understand and know how important this hemoglobin A1C is in the management of diabetes mellitus. For the purpose of clarity, we are going to conduct this session in, the, in a different format. The format in which we are going to conduct this session will be in the form of question and answer. That is, we are going to ask a question and we are going to provide an answer to it so that everybody can get the sense of what we are talking about. Now let's set the ball rolling. What is hemoglobin A1C? Hemoglobin A1C is a laboratory test that physicians use to diagnose and to determine if a patient is diabetic or not. And if it has been fully established that a patient is diabetic, they also use it to monitor and to manage the medical condition so that it does not progress to the level of complications. And this is the reason why this hemoglobin A1C test is very, very important. How does the hemoglobin A1C work? Just as its name is called hemoglobin A1C, that shows that hemoglobin is the main subject of this test. Now that leaves us with the question, what is hemoglobin and what does it do to the body? Well, hemoglobin is an ion carrying protein that is inside the red blood cell. And its main function is to go to the lungs and pick up oxygen and distributes oxygen throughout the body cell. And that is its main job. But unfortunately, or fortunately enough, something very mysterious to the medical scientists happened. You know, they discovered that this same hemoglobin has a very strong affinity to attract sugars in the blood to itself. So what am I saying? I'm saying that any sugar in the blood attach themselves to hemoglobin. Now they say, wait a minute. Something very interesting is going to happen. It's going to be coming up. So they, they begin to say that, why can't we use this to predict this glycemic control of the diabetic patient? That is, we can even use it to diagnose if a person is diabetic or not. So they say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do more research into it. And they carry out, uh, they carry on a research and then they came up with a chart, an hemoglobin A1C chart. So in this chart, it calculated a different amount of sugar attached to hemoglobin. And now they convert the amount of sugar, they convert it into percentage. And they call this percentage A1C. And that's how A1C has come to be up to, up to now meaning that A1C is the average amount of sugar attached to hemoglobin over the course of three months because the lifespan of red blood cell is three months. After three months, red blood cell dies and a new one is being produced by the body. And that is the reason why they have to conduct this test every three months. The chart went further to show the measuring unit used in the calculation of amount of sugar that is attached to hemoglobin in milligram per deciliter. And that is the one that we commonly use here in the United States. They actually use millimole per liter, which is very commonly used in Europe. But for the purpose of clarity, let me show you the graphical representation of what I'm saying so that everything will be clearer to us. Like I said, this is the graphical representation of how glucose attached to hemoglobin. This is the red blood cell, and this is hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. And this is the sugar that has attached itself to hemoglobin. And this is the result of it. That is, red blood cell in which hemoglobin is inside it actually attracted to sugar, and the sugar attached itself to hemoglobin. And now this hemoglobin becomes glycated. We call it glycated hemoglobin, or sometimes we call it glycosylated hemoglobin. And that is how what the scientists found in the blood that is very mysterious to them. Now, they said they're going to do more research. They conducted more research 
and they come up with a chart and this chart shows different amount of sugar or different it shows calculation of different amount of sugar attached to hemoglobin and they convert it this amount they convert it into percentage and they call that percentage a1c and now let me show you the chart that they actually come up with this is hemoglobin a1c chart that shows the calculation of various amounts of sugar attached to hemoglobin over the course of three months for example they give it a measuring unit they said the amount will be in milligram per deciliter which is very commonly used here in the united states then they also measure it in milli millimole per liter and which is commonly used in europe and now a1c will be in the form of percentage that is they're going to take the percentage of of this amount and it will give us the percentage and that would be the a1c now what they did was they did a study and they find that if 117 milligram per deciliter amount of sugar attached to hemoglobin over three months or using millimole per liter is 6.5 over the course of three months is percent or percentage of that amount will be 5.7 and that 5.7 will now stand for the a1c of that particular patient and they carry it on for so many amount of sugar attached up to like maybe 16 a1c but now they discover that with this they should be able to come up with a diagnostic guideline and that is why the world health organization who suggests that they should come out with you know diagnostic guideline and so many other health organizations like american diabetic association also uh, confirmed that and they said that yes they acknowledge that fact that they should do something like that and that is the reason why they try to classify the patients into three categories that the first category of patients will be healthy non-diabetic and the second will be pre-diabetic meaning that that patient is predisposed to diabetic if care is not taken now the, the third category of patients will be the full-blown diabetic patient and that's the way they classify it and now i'm going to show you the diagnostic guidelines yeah, they came up with and I will explain that to you now. This is the hemoglobin A1C diagnostic guidelines they came up with. Now they classify patients into three categories. The first category, they label it healthy non-diabetic patient. And the second category is labeled as pre-diabetic patient. Meaning that this diabetic is this diabetic patient is predisposed to diabetic if care is not taken. Now the third category is labeled as being diabetic, that is, is full-blown diabetic patient. Now, what did they do? They carried out an intensive study on healthy non-diabetic patients, and the result find out that any amount of sugar that is less than 117 milligram per deciliter, or any amount of sugar that is less than 6.5 millimole per liter and its a1c is less than 5.7 this patient is not diabetic and is healthy non-diabetic patients why because this excess amount of sugar attached to hemoglobin over the course of three months cannot actually affect the smooth running of the body meaning that it will still put the body in a state of homeostasis. Now they went to the second category, which is pre-diabetic. Now they carry out an intensive study on pre-diabetic patients, and the result came out to be any amount of sugar that is less than, I mean that is greater than 117 milligram per deciliter or greater than 6.5 millimole per liter and its A1C is greater than 5.7. These patients 
is pre-diabetic. Why? Because this amount of sugar greater than 117 milligrams per deciliter can actually affect the smooth running of the body. That is, it may not put the body in a state of homeostasis. Now, the third category of patients, they carry out an intensive study on diabetic patients. And the result came out to be that any amount of sugar that is greater than 140 milligram per deciliter or greater than 7.8 millimole per liter and the A1C is greater than 6.4. This type of patient or this class of patient will be regarded as being diabetic. So, many, and what does that mean? That means that this greater than 140 milligram per deciliter amount of sugar in the bloodstream without being used will definitely affect the smooth running of the body, meaning that it's going to interfere with the body homeostasis. And that's exactly what they did. They update these diagnostic guidelines from time to time to meet the challenge of time. How reliable and accurate is this hemoglobin A1C for all patients? Hemoglobin A1C test is not accurate for all patients. Any patient that his body cannot produce enough hemoglobin, this particular test is not accurate and not reliable for them. And that is how we come up to these factors affecting the accuracy of hemoglobin A1C test. For example, if a patient has a blood disorder such as sickle cell anemia, because of the shape of their red blood cell is sickled and may not contain hemoglobin and have enough hemoglobin, this particular test is not good for them. It's not going to work for them. Then we have some patients that have a condition, a medical condition called thalassemia. And this is a, def a genetic defect in the DNA of people. A patient that has this condition cannot rely on hemoglobin A1C test because it's not going to be accurate on them. Now, we have some patients also that their blood is being destroyed in the bloodstream called hemolytic anemia. They are also not a candidate for this test. And also those who have iron deficiency anemia, that condition is going to really produce false increased A1C. It's not, a give, it's not going to give us correct information. For that reason, they are not a candidate for this test. And we have some patients that have uncommon forms of hemoglobin. It's not a candidate for them. Or also, it's going to give false increase or decrease A1C. Then we have some patients that have certain kidney or liver diseases. These are not also a good candidate for hemoglobin A1C test. We have some people that have blood loss or blood transfusion or take blood transfusion. It's also not good for them because it's not going to be reliable and not accurate for them. But does that mean that their hope is now dashed or their hope is lost? No. They can actually ask their doctor to conduct an alternative test for them. And this is the test I'm going to show you now. This is the alternative test for non-A1C test candidates that they can ask their doctor to actually conduct for, on them. Uh, the first one is called fructosamine test. And the second one is called glycomac test. And also they can ask the doctor to recommend continuous glucose monitoring system, which is CGMS. So this is in the form of sensor. They stick it to their arm with a scanner. They use the scanner to scan the sensor and they immediately get their blood sugar level right away. And this, can, this is what they can do to monitor their blood sugar level to make sure that they are managing their medical condition very well. How will my doctor know that I'm not a candidate for the A1C test? This is how your doctor will know if you are a candidate for hemoglobin A1C test. First of all, it's going to order for your CBC 
lab work. That is, your complete blood can't lab work. Then when he gets it, he will go straight to check your hemoglobin level. Then he will check the level if it falls within the range, that is, between 13.0 and 17.7. .7. Now, this is a typical CBC lab work of a typical patient. Now, for example, this particular patient level of hemoglobin is 16.0 and this was the previous one that he took was 16.9. Now, let's see if this 16.0 falls within the range. Now, yes, it does. It falls within the range because 16.0 is not less than 13.0. Then 16.0 also is not more than 17.7. .7. So that means that this patient is actually a candidate for hemoglobin A1C test. And that's exactly how your doctor is going to know if you are a candidate for hemoglobin A1C test. Because let's suppose that his uh, level of hemoglobin was less than 13.0. They, they may be speculating of one of the factors affecting accuracy of hemoglobin A1C test, such as blood loss. Or let's suppose this amount or this level 16.0 is more than 17.7. .7. We may be speculating that maybe the patient has or got you know, a blood transfusion. And, and that is one of the conditions that we said, you know, can affect the accuracy and reliability of hemoglobin A1C test. But in this case, this typical patient is level of hemoglobin, is level of hemoglobin falls within the range, which we call reference interval. How often can a healthy non-diabetic, a pre-diabetic, and a diabetic person Take the test. As far as healthy non-diabetic patient is concerned, expert's recommendation is that they should include test this A1C test in their annual medical checkup so that if there is any problem, they can detect it early. Early detection is the best because the fact that you are not diabetic or pre-diabetic this year does not say that you may not be diabetic next year because the kind of food that we eat, the lifestyle that we lead, all these have a role to play in this disease state. And it's better to catch it early. So once they catch it early, they'll be able to arrest the situation. And that's the reason why the experts recommended that it's very advisable for them to check their A1C level, you know, to their A1C test to do it every annual medical checkup. So that will help them a lot. Now, in the case of pre-diabetic patients, Esper recommended that they can actually take the test every six months. That will help them to handle effectively or manage their, their pre-diabetes condition very well. And that is a very good advice for them. Then as far as those who are full-blown diabetic patients, it's recommended for them to actually conduct this test every three months so that because their condition is, is worse, it's terrible, it's very close to complications. So in order to prevent that complication level, then they need to check it every three months. And that is the advice that experts give as far as this is concerned. Why is hemoglobin A1C test very important? Hemoglobin A1C test is very, very important. The reason why it's so important is because we want to use it to monitor and to manage the diabetic condition so that it does not get worse or progress to the level of complications. For example, if there is excess of sugar in the bloodstream that has been staying there for a long period of time, the body converts it into fatty acid and the body carries it into every part of the body, especially to the vital organs. For example, it may take it to the heart and dump it on the blood vessel of the heart 
and left something we call plaque, which we call atherosclerosis. And this is a situation whereby it hardens the blood vessel and also narrow it. And from doing this, it can build up pressure. And this pressure of the blood vessel can actually result into cardiovascular events such as stroke or heart failure. Or it may take it to the heart. I mean, sorry, it may take it to the eye and tamper with the integrity of the optic nerves and cause blindness. It may also take it to the kidney and cause kidney failure. It may also dump it on the nerves of the leg and foot and destroy the nerves of the foot and leg. You can imagine a situation whereby a person steps on the sharp object and he does not know. Why? Because the excess sugar has destroyed the nerves of the foot. That's why it's been numbed and it cannot actually know that it step on a sharp object. And what is the result? It, leave, it may leave a sore or like a cut and gangrene setting and this gangrene setting and this uh, sore cannot be healed. And what is going to be the result? Amputation. So it can cause amputation in that respect. So this is one of the reasons why we say that it's very, very important to manage the medical condition of diabetes so that it will not reach a level of complications. So friends, in order to help you actually prevent this level of complication in diabetes mellitus, we encourage you to watch the following video. This is a video that is showing how diabetes complication does happen in reality. So hopefully by the time you watch this video, you'll be able to appreciate how important this particular hemoglobin A1C test is in the management of diabetes mellitus. We want to warn you actually that the images in this particular video is going to be disturbing and viewers' discretion is strongly advised. This picture is sort of an overview of some of the long-term complications of diabetes. So there's an increased incidence of stroke because of the atherosclerosis that can develop in the large vessels supplying the brain. And we've noticed that diabetic retinopathy can occur and cataracts are also more common in diabetes. And unfortunately, we've noticed that atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries means that ischemic heart disease leading to such complications as myocardial infarction is actually the most common cause of death in diabetes. Nephropathy, disease of the kidneys. In the UK, the most common cause of end-stage renal failure is diabetic nephropathy. In many Western countries, it's the leading cause of end-stage renal failure. And we've noticed that there's reduced healing and increased risk of skin infections in any part of the body. Atheroma in the large arteries can lead to peripheral vascular disease. If these vessels here are partly blocked off, you can see there's going to be less blood going to all of the leg. Impotence is a complication of the autonomic neuropathy. Microvascular disease, as we've noticed, is going to affect the eyes, the kidneys, and it can affect the blood, the small nerves, the peripheral nerves in the leg, leading to neuropathy. Ulcers are a possibility. Ischemic ulcers can develop in the leg, and neuropathic ulcers can develop in the feet, as we've noticed under the callus. Not always under callus, but very often under callus, leading to areas of infection. If it's bad enough, that can lead to frank gangrene, where there's total ischemia of the distal tissues and they go black. Peripheral neuropathy, we've noted. 
vaginal and urinary infections. In actual fact, vaginal infections can be a, a presentation of type 1 or type 2 diabetes, probably more type 2 diabetes really, because the high levels of sugars in the vaginal secretions mean that fungal infections are particularly likely. But urinary tract infections are also more probable. Peripheral neuropathy can affect the arms, but mostly affects the legs. And actually, we could have, add here the autonomic effects. For example, we noted the dysphagia because of the autonomic effect on the esophagus and the gastroparesis because of the autonomic effect on the stomach. And also the autonomic effects can affect the heart and all of the blood vessels globally, leading to the postural hypotension, which we also noted. So let's have good control of patients with diabetes. Let's keep the blood sugar levels low. Let's correct the other risk factors for macrovascular disease. And let's keep these patients as healthy as we can for as long as we can by establishing and maintaining good glycemic control and treating other risk factors such as hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Well, here we're looking at some classic diabetic foot callus. You can see the hard patches of keratinized skin. And this has occurred in several places over the surface of this patient's foot. Here we see some under the toenail. And the suspicion has to be that there's a pressure area and an area of infection underneath this area of hard callus. Here we see some hard callus which has been peeled off and this can be now cut off and this wound can be allowed to heal by secondary intention. But you've got to get rid of the hard callus on top first to open up the wound so you can then get in to heal it by secondary intention. Well here we see a particularly severe case of peripheral vascular disease the dressing covers an injury which uh, wouldn't heal due to ischemia you can clearly see the black and necrotic tissue on the toes the patient's already lost the other limb due to peripheral vascular disease requiring amputation so we see the black necrotic areas where basically there's no blood getting to at all and the areas have simply died. This toe is essentially dead tissue now. It's gangrenous. Essentially the toe is decomposing. Significant discoloration of the foot. This patient was actually systemically confused Bacteria from the decomposing area was getting into the systemic circulation, giving rise to the risk of a systemic blood poisoning. A little bit of gauze there to try and stop the toes from rubbing together, but didn't make any difference really. This limb actually required amputation shortly after these shots. No pulse palpable there on the foot. I couldn't feel anything at all actually. Posterior tibial again, I couldn't feel anything at all. This was the end stage of a long term disease process. It wasn't acute, it was a long term ongoing chronic condition that deteriorated to this level of severity. In, in a diabetic patient. We can see here that part of the uh, great toe has already been removed and that the second toe is showing significant discoloration and infection. 
And this infection has spread to an area of cellulitis affecting the foot, which has been marked off with the felt pen. This will allow us to detect if there's any spread of the infection. When we look at the plantar surface of the foot, we see a lesion underneath the second toe. The patient was largely unaware of this because he has sensory peripheral neuropathy. And this lesion developed as a result of pressure, resulting in an area of necrosis. It became rapidly infected and the infection unfortunately tracked to the bone leading to osteomyelitis. This set up chronic infection within the toe and as you can see there's a large area of uh, cavitation caused by the necrosis. Here we see betadine being injected into the wound to kill any infective organisms that are there but of course it can't reach all parts of the all parts of the wound because the patient has osteomyelitis. Unfortunately shortly, shortly after these shots were taken it was necessary to uh, amputate this infected toe in order to remove the area of osteomyelitis. Here we can see the large area of necrotic tissue by the amount of packing that it's able to put into this toe. This shows the amount of tissue which has been destroyed by the infection. And because this patient had type 2 diabetes mellitus, the normal inflammatory changes and the normal inflammatory defence mechanisms worked less effectively than in a non-diabetic patient. Here we see a very nice dressing being applied, but this was very much a palliative measure prior to the amputation which was shortly subsequently required. Viewers, if you like the content of this video and want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to this channel. And don't forget to turn on your push notification. Don't forget to like this video and comment so I can get your feedback. Thank you for tuning in to the Health Education Channel.